Hi, and welcome everyone. Today we are joined by Andrea Borchak, the Norman R. Poses Chair of Business and Transactional Law and Co-Director of the Business and Transactional Law Center at Washburn University School of Law. We'll be talking about implicit bias in bankruptcy, and I will turn it over to Pro Professor Boyack now. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you, Shannon. I'm so happy to be here with you talking today about what I think is an important topic. This whole uh, entire seminar is great because we're hitting on so many different aspects of uh, racial uh, justice issues in the law. And so I'm talking today about implicit bias in bankruptcy. Um, I did a similar session for a bunch of bankruptcy practitioners. Obviously, I'm not going to assume that any of you are experts in bankruptcy, although um, if you are, that's great. Maybe it'll become even more uh, more interesting and relevant, but I'm going to give you enough background that if you've never taken any bankruptcy class or know nothing about it, at least you'll start to see some of the issues that we have here. Okay, so I, uh, when I did this in July 2020 uh, for bankruptcy practitioners, I started out by asking them what factors would lead them to advise a debtor to file a bankruptcy in which chapter, and I'm talking about a consumer debtor here, an individual. There are basically two chapters that most individuals file bankruptcy under. Um, there's a liquidation chapter, which is chapter seven, where in a matter of just a few months, debtors will sell all of their non-exempt assets, pay out whatever debts they can, and start over with a fresh slate. Um, and then there's chapter 13, where the debt gets restructured and the debtor makes monthly payments over a course of three to five or even longer years. And so there are a bunch of different things that if you think about this in the abstract, that an attorney might advise, oh, a given hy hypothetical situation, you might say to a debtor, this chapter is the better chapter for you, or this chapter is the right chapter for you. And so I brainstormed with practitioners about this, the idea of whether a debtor has assets that are exempt or not. So can they keep them? What sort of discharges can they get? What kind of income changes are going to happen over the short term? There's that timing issue. Do they need to get a discharge quickly or can they wait for a matter of years? Do they have money up front to pay for legal representation? Because interestingly, if you're going to do a chapter seven where you sell everything and start over, you have to pay your attorney before you file in full. And in chapter 13, you can make those payments over the course of three to five years. Um, there is a uh, an income test bar to filing chapter seven so that people who earn too much money supposedly can't file a chapter seven, although I'll talk about uh, in a minute how that's not that much of a bar. And um, that there are certain types of debts that have better outcomes through a seven. And also again, that length of the impact of future filings. If you file a seven, you can't file again for longer than if you file a 13. Um, on the other hand, you're probably more likely to put a debtor into a Chapter 13 restructuring if there are not um, assets that are exempt and they need to preserve them or they want to have a slightly higher discharge. If they can wait longer to have the discharge um, happen at the end of making all these payments, if they don't have money available to pay for legal representation up front, if they have uh, not a, too much kinds of certain kinds of debt or um, not enough other kinds of debt or uh, too high of an income, maybe they can't file a seven. Uh, what sorts of debts do they have? Can they get them uh, discharged at all in a seven? And again, the impact on future filings. Well, the interesting thing about talking about that in the abstract is that it sounds like there's certainly not any sort of implicit bias that's coming into this calculation, right? It's a very, uh, a very calculated, objective question. However, in a famous study um, done in the early 2000s, there were multiple different instances where they found that uh, looking at the data, people who were debtors who were non-white, Blacks especially, were routinely steered away from certain types of financial services and transactions and ended up becoming into uh, put into a 13. So they did this experiment with um, bankruptcy professionals and they gave them hypothetical situations and they've split them into two groups. Um, they gave half of them the fictional debtor couple of Todd and Allison and half of them the fictional debtor couple of Reggie and Letitia. But the thing that the people didn't realize is that the uh, all of the information about Todd and Allison and Reggie and Letitia were exactly 
identical. They had the same exact income, they had the same kind of debts, they had the same kind of assets. Everything was the same. All they did was change the name and the name of the church that Todd and Allison versus Let Reggie and Letitia went to. And then they gave it to those bankruptcy professionals and said, which chapter would you, you know, help advise this client to go to? Sort of like a law school exam, right? Your, this is your hypothetical. And what sort of was mind blowing about this is that um, overall, vastly more, like <laughs> yeah, there was sort of flip flop, like two thirds to three fourths of the attorneys considering the Reggie and Letitia case advised them to go into a chapter 13 where they would have a three to five year payout, restructuring the debts, stay in bankruptcy three to five years and only after that get the discharge and exactly the opposite was true for the todd and allison uh hypothetical is that two-thirds to three-fourths of the attorneys said oh todd and allison should file a chapter seven they can get a a uh, discharge quickly and this you know little experiment sort of really shocked i think not only everybody who saw the results but the people who even were involved who thought well gosh i'm not a racist person why would i put one person in a certain type of chapter and, and advise the other one to do the other approach based simply on sort of, and it never raised the couple, but, but sort of an implied uh, identity of this couple. And so that spawned a lot of study and a lot of discussion. Um, there was a piece that came out in 2012 that caused a great stir. It was in ProPublica and a bunch of other things and uh, with Brocker Cohen and Lawless. Um, big names in bankruptcy practice and they found that across the board black debtors are much more likely to be in the 13 than other debtors and that consumer bankruptcy attorneys maybe are the ones who are creating that disparity in chapter choice and that makes sense because usually the consumer debtors when they walk through the door to talk to an attorney they don't know the difference between a chapter 7 and a chapter 13 and they're going to rely on legal expertise um so then there's another article in 2017 I'm sorry, the Brocker, Cohen, Lawless, Law, there's a lot of article, ProPublica did an article based on the article, looking at certain case studies where this was true and these disparate impacts. And this caused a little bit of a stir in the bankruptcy community because nobody likes to look in the mirror and say, oh my, am I doing something that is creating some sort of racial bias? Um, so another thing that people have started looking at is the access to bankruptcy issue which is something that I've been uh, looking at now for several years, um, that you can have a no money down bankruptcy, zero upfront costs, but only in a 13. And so that's sort of bizarre because it means that people who don't have cash on hand might be steered away from a chapter seven. And then we have to look at, see, you know, do certain, um, certain populations of debtors, are they more likely to lack that cash on hand that would give them access to bankruptcy? And also, are people just too poor to file for bankruptcy to begin with? Um, there is an interesting case uh, study coming from the Consumer Bankruptcy Project just three years ago that found the two most significant predictors of whether a consumer is filing one of these no money down bankruptcies is not what kind of debts or assets they have, but where do they live? And by that, I mean, is it a majority white or a majority non-white neighborhood and um, the person's race itself? So that is, again, a really troubling bit of uh, factual data coming out there. But I do think that there's an intersection here. And you can see that, you know, between the economics and the race of the debtors. And, and you can see that with what's going on right now. The access to bankruptcy question looms large because we have a huge economic downturn, the, the largest that we've had in my whole life. And there are fewer bankruptcies now in um, going on right now, consumer bankruptcies, than there have been in prior years. I mean, it's down somewhere between, gosh, you know, like, I wrote it down here and I can't find it in my notes. Like, uh, I think it was 20, you know, 12 to 20 percent, depending on where you look at it by month or by year. So that's quite troubling or worrisome because we're wondering, is bankruptcy even serving its purpose, which is to give people a ability to step away from sort of crushing debt and start over? Um, now, there has been some problem, uh, some pushback in the chapter choice question. Some people have said, well, this is not because people are racist. This is not because anyone is deciding that people who are black deserve to be in one chapter or another. What it really is, is it's connected with the, uh, the economic circumstances, which are different. The idea that certain people uh, who are poorer maybe can't get into a chapter seven. That, I guess, um, in some ways you might think is good news, but in some ways I think it's, it's bad news, you know, and maybe the problem is really, it's not just economics, not just legal, it's both. 
Um, so someone said the methodology is wrong. It's not caused by race. It's caused by socioeconomic status. Another uh, another commentator said, well, there's some benefits that people who are poorer need, like they need a car because they live in a food desert or they live in a job desert, a transportation desert. And so that's why they need to be in a seven. I mean, a 13 instead of a seven. But the real problem here is that maybe it's both. Maybe the economic and the legal impacts of the system are both creating disparate impact. And so maybe the legal system can't just approach this as if there aren't economic differentials. We need to engage with the reality of the economic differentials and make sure that there are pathways to addressing them in the law. Um, in 2019, just a year ago, the American Bankruptcy Institute did a study about how the bankruptcy legal system needs to change. And they found the number one problem was implicit bias in bankruptcy. Um, and that it had to do with this chapter choice issue I discussed, but it's not just chapter choice for if somebody that has their thing muted, they might want to mute. I'm hearing some background noise. Um, but also the other questions too. Um, and as we'll talk about, this problem is systemic. This is not just to say that there's implicit bias that attorneys are coping with, and it's not just uh, implicit bias that maybe creditors and debtors have. It's also trustees and it's also judges. There, and uh, as it said in the ABI study that the complex interaction among the debtors, attorneys, trustees, judges, and other system actors, a lot of system actors in bankruptcy are creating this context for disparities. And none of the studies discussed identified conscious racism. So that's the good news. Nobody is intending, or they're not finding uh, any significant indication that anyone is intending there to be a different impact of bankruptcy on people who are not white. Good news. However, that implicit racial bias is still baked into the system and baked into people's subconsciousness in such a way that we're creating disparate impacts on debtors who are not white. So what are we going to do in our brief time together today? We're going to talk about just very quickly in a few charts, which I'll run through because I find charts communicate uh, some good data very quickly about the question of disparate economic circumstances that um, that non-white debtors have from compared to white debtors. And then we're going to see how the bankruptcy code and maybe the bankruptcy system work to the disadvantage of non-white and also poorer debtors. Um, and that will help sort of debias our perceptions about this. Then uh, we're going to talk about what implicit bias means just in general. Maybe you haven't focused on that yet and how it might influence people's decisions generally and uh, understand. And this is a really important point is that being implicitly biased doesn't mean that we are acting in explicitly biased ways or intentionally biased ways. In fact, quite the opposite. Every single person has implicit bias and it is driving decisions we're making without us even realizing it and maybe contrary to our uh, our intent, actually, and also we're going to I'm going to point out some specific areas in the bankruptcy system in specific that uh, involve some subjectivity, because those are the key points where implicit bias might skew behaviors one way or the other. Um, the bankruptcy code, you know, like, like most code law seems to be very um, sort of objective, but it really isn't. There's a lot of subjectivity in the system. And finally, if we have time, I will talk about about a few little techniques that all of us can do to help improve a uh, debias our uh, interactions and improve them and our decision making. And that's not just for bankruptcy, it's for beyond. So quickly, disparate financial realities in the US. Now, this is not any sort of value statement. These are just the facts. So the facts are is that the median wealth of families today is hugely different. Now we're talking about the medians. Of course, you can give me counterexamples on both sides, but it's hugely different for a white family and for a Latina or a black family. And if you look at those little dots, even if you can't, you know, the numbers don't mean a lot to you, you can see that the disparity here is quite stark. And that disparity is along several metrics. There's an income disparity. And then there's this disparity that gets compounded over time. That's about assets and wealth. And part of that is because you have assets and wealth through our property law system transfer through generations. So the intergenerational income disparity and asset disparity gets compounded as, uh, as time goes by. There's also a big debt disparity. If you look at, um, as we'll see in a second, things, uh, not just the total amount of debt, but the certain types of debt that are much more likely to be impacting um, debtors and families in that are of certain races. 
Um, there is a, also a huge disparate financial literacy and experience that you can track and uh, an access to credit disparity. There's also a cost of credit disparity. There's been a lot of wonderful things written lately that have focused on this huge problem of how much it costs to be poor, that you have to pay a lot more to, to cash your check that you get from your work, for example, if you don't have a credit uh, um, a banking account. There's a disparity in housing, not just how much housing costs, but are you an owner or a renter, or uh, and how stable is your housing? How much of your income do you have to allocate to your housing? Um, things of that nature. And there's this equity funding disparity. Do you have assets that you can pull upon to fund things like going to college? So 10 quick charts here, just quickly, even if you don't read the numbers, just look at the shapes. This is showing the wealth inequality over time. And you can see going up from 63 to 83 to 2016, that the disparity of wealth in this country has increased dramatically. Um, distribution of family income, uh, that if you look at the difference between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile, um, you can see that the income disparity is also widening. It's not just the wealth. Again, wealth is how much you own and income is how much you're earning. And so that's growing as well. If you break this down by race, you see that the disparity between white families and uh, black and also Hispanic families has grown significantly at well. There's There's been some narrowing and then widening of the gap, but the gap is still huge. I mean, you look at the 10 times more of a wealth gap um, between white families and back, black families and eight times more between white and Hispanic, again, at the median. Um, average wealth for people based on age. Well, this is interesting too, because this isn't even just intergenerational. It means that over time, the wealth that you have, uh, the, dis the dis disparate wealth of uh, black and white families at the median grows from when they're young to being much, much older by the time they re retire. And then of course, that's the amount that can be passed on. Um, there's a disparateness of lifetime earnings, I note that there's also a disparate between men and women, um, and we could talk about that, but that's a whole uh, additional layer of complexity here. But you can see that disparate impact. You can see a disparate home ownership rate, and this has been in a way pretty steady. It narrowed a little bit, then widened, narrowed a little bit, then widened, but you have much higher percentage of white families who own their own home. And that has a lot of impacts in terms of um, asset, and wealth and also um, accessibility and cost of credit. There's a, a difference in retirement savings. And I wanna point this out because we'll come back to it, but look at the average retirement savings of the white family compared to the non-white families um, that have been looked at in the study. And you can see that we're talking about hugely more, um, what is it, uh, what is that for? Six times more plus um, of retirement savings. Student loan debt, much higher for non-white families, although interestingly for Hispanic uh, debtors, actually a little bit lower. You can see also that it goes up over time. So we have more student loan debt for younger people and more today than before. Um, and also this is showing the number of families with student loan debt, not just how the student loan debt uh, is distributed. So wealth gaps, I know I've thrown a lot of charts at you, but this is just to get you the idea that, oh wow, we really do have a difference in median net worth. We really do have a difference in income. We have this big gap and that's just the facts. Now the question is if we take the law and the policies behind the law and we put them on these facts, what do we do? Are we making things better or are we making things worse? And I think that a lot of our policies and our laws, unfortunately, are actually making things worse. There's some tax things, for example, that you have that actually reward people for owning homes and penalize people relatively for not owning homes. If you have a disparate home ownership rate, those benefits and you know penalties are really going to be felt differently. And the same thing for retirement savings. All right. Let's get back to bankruptcy now that we've talked about the economy of the world. Um, based on all of this in income, what kind of bankruptcy code problems do we have? Once I pointed this out to practitioners, we started brainstorming and thought, well, actually, yeah, there are a lot of things in the bankruptcy code that systematically punish people for not having the right types of assets and having the wrong types of debt. It's built into the bankruptcy code. 
we have things like retirement funds. You can keep your retirement funds if you file for bankruptcy, as long as they're in certain types of employee sponsored plans or qualifying plans, the kinds of plans that those white families are much more likely to have. You can keep your home in many states, once again, or at least part of your home in many states. But once again, that is a benefit that is not equally allocated among people. You have the lesser ability to ever discharge your student debt, which of course is going to work to the detriment of the debtors that have more student debt. So these are kind of built into the code already. Now let's talk about people's minds. Do you have implicit bias? Spoiler alert, you do. You do because we all do. Everyone of every race, you know, I want to say in the world, but at least in this country has implicit bias. Um, in fact, we all do because it's a way our mind works. So you can think quickly about who your people are, that if you were going to kind of group yourself culturally, people who share identifiable values, norms, symbols, the kinds of groups that maybe you feel more comfortable with because they're more like you. And different people are going to sort this differently. Maybe it's by language, maybe it's by uh, ethnicity, maybe it's by where they live, maybe it's their experience or their level of education or their religion or sexual orientation, but your peeps, right? This is your in-group, your cultural groups. And that's not just race. It might not even be race for you um, at some level, but there are people that you automatically see commonality with, and then there are people who seem more distinct. If you take a couple minutes, which we won't do now, um, I suggest you do this because it's a wonderful self uh, sort of exploration. List the attributes in your own cultural identity that would define you and just be honest with yourself. Know that you only see this list. Doing that is very helpful because the very first step to combating your own implicit bias is to consider what your identity characteristics are so you can uh, sort of sort out who you automatically assume is in your group and who you don't put in that category. Um, so that's the outgroup bias, the idea that I'm already more uh, favorably disposed to people in my in-group. Now, outgroups can be based on the fact that I have distrust certain, you know, characteristics or uncomfortable, but it also could just be implicit. It's just that I happen to feel more favorable towards people with whom I share commonality. That's human nature. Um, and again, everyone has this. We might define that in-group differently, but we all have that ability. Don't berate yourself if you realize that you do have in-group preferences. Everyone does. It's about becoming aware of it, not about, you know, sort of shaking your finger at somebody or blaming them or feeling guilty. It's not about guilt at all. It's really about growth. So the neuroscience here supports that this exists. 80 to 90 percent of our mind works without our conscious awareness, which is kind of mind blowing for people who uh, who like to be really, um, you know, engaged in mental processes that, wow, even all of our deliberate decision making, that's only like 10% of what's going on. Everything else is happening subconsciously. We are exposed to so much information every day, 11 million pieces by some estimates. We can only handle about 40 at a time. So how do we deal with that? We have mental shortcuts. We have past knowledge. We have what we call heuristics. We make a bunch of assumptions and these we term mind habits. There are ways that our mind has evolved to process a lot of information. Um, and so a little quote here that I put, we see what we look for and we look for what we know. This is how we make sense of the world. We've had however many years we've had on this planet to develop these mind habits. And they're important. They're, they're a part of our survival instinct. But it's important to pause and consider what they are so we understand how our unconscious mind is working. So the first thing I want to mention are things like schemas. Um, also, you could think of automaticity. These are your mental sh shortcuts that help you organize and categorize information. I have up here two pictures of squares, right? And if I say square, you might in your mind have something that looks very much like this picture, like the big uh, yellow or the smaller blue square. You think, okay, four sides all the same. I know what a square is. And if somebody says square, you don't have to pause and consider what they're saying because we know what that means. And we have like an image in our head about it. This is very helpful and time saving. Um, I did a little experiment with my own children this summer. We were at the, the beach and I said, okay, let's, you know, I'm going to say a word and describe what image comes to mind. And so I said seashell. 
what was interesting is some of the kids said, oh, I get this feeling, uh, a mental image of something that looks like a conch. And others said, oh, mine looks more like a clamshell, you know, like, sort of like this. And then some people had a different big shells, little shells. And then we did dog. Some people had sort of a golden retriever. Someone had a chihuahua. Someone had a, you know, a German shepherd. So if you just say dog or seashell, you're going to have a certain image. And that's not to say you don't know that there are other types of shells and dogs. It's just that's your uh, sort of default concept of what that is. Now we get into more problems when we start having these kind of schemas work in social categories because, okay, it doesn't matter to which seashell you think of, but if someone says the word criminal, what image comes to mind? Or lawyer, or debtor, or judge, right? We have a certain image that comes to mind and that's the problem. You know, we've heard this a lot with STEM that someone says, well, why is it that when someone thinks of scientists, even as a young child, they think of a male scientist and not a female scientist, or maybe a white scientist and not a non-white scientist. Now these things can change and is based on your experience, but pause and recognize where your social categories are uh, existing in a schema kind of way. Um, the other thing to think about is not just the schemas, but where your subjective decision-making is in your life. Um, and you've learned in law school probably already about the difference between rules and standards, where standards are looking at sort of balancing factors and which one is more, and rules supposedly you're applying specific elements. Um, although I think that we almost have no purely objective part of the law because our decision makers at every point, from the lawyers and the individuals all the way up through the judges and juries, are humans, and they are going to bring their own um, subjectivity to their decision making. You also have this overlay of equity onto the law where it's explicitly subjective and judges are making decisions um, about what's fair and what's right. Um, that is a hugely loaded concept. And even if you're trying your very best to be um, even handed, a lot of this onomasticity and schemas and your implicit bias and your in-groups, that's all going to feed into those decision making. Um, so if you're having still problems conceptualizing it, I'll give you just one other example. This is called the Stroop test. And um, maybe you've done this before. If you look at this box, it has the different colors, the names of the colors written out in the color that's written. So red is written in red, orange is written in orange, blue is written in blue. And as you read the names of these colors, you can do it very quickly because both of these things go together. You have red and green, uh, both the color red and the word red go together. But if we change it around and we write the color in the name of the color in a different color, it is harder. You take a little more time to read this. Your mind has to sort of, it rebels against itself because you're reading the word red, but it's written in green and you're reading the word orange, but heck, that's blue. And so your mind is sort of battling against itself. This is just showing you how the onomasticity works in your brain and how hard it is to push back against that. Um, again, everyone has a schema, everyone has an implicit bias, and that is both preference for a group, positive or negative, um, usually outside our awareness, stereotypes and attitudes we hold. This is developed through your life and um, it includes both feelings and also sort of stereotypes. Um, again, I every one of us has these implicit biases. And I think one of the most harmful things going on right now is the idea that somehow you are a bad person if you have them, because that is counterproductive. The more productive thing is to recognize that you do have them rather than to defensively claim you don't, and then become aware of what they are and, and notice where they might have more and less effects in your life. If you want to test yourself, perhaps you've already done this, it's actually quite interesting. You can go to Project Implicit, it's being done through the Harvard uh, website, and they have a bunch of tests where you can sort of see where your implicit bias might lie. So how does this impact the bankruptcy system, which is what we're talking about today? Um, there are two main types that implicit bias feeds through the system. One of them has to do with bias that we've built into the law itself through legislation, through past decision making. Um, and that's true in contracts and finance securities, in the bankruptcy code provision, in state law exemptions, even in things like voidable transfer law and collections law. I'll talk a little bit about some of these. There's also biases that individuals, um, both, you know, that, that people have. And you have those feelings, uh, those impacts happening through individual uh, actions and also just the sum total of actions of all the people that work within the bankruptcy system. Um, judges, trustees, lawyers, et cetera. 
So let's just consider a few of these. And maybe you've already thought about this. Uh, first year law school, you take contract law and you think, okay, there's a lot of objectivity here, but there's a lot of subjectivity too. And some of our objective rules might end up creating uh, disparate impacts in the real world. So let's just take a couple things as an example of this. The objective theory of manifestation of assent, that duty to read, the idea that if you manifest assent to something, you are deemed bound because you are deemed to have chosen it. Um, but if you apply the same rule, so equal rule to different categories of people, you might end up with different results. People that don't have as much legal advice or maybe lack financial experience can end up uh, agreeing to contract terms that work to their financial disadvantage without realizing it. Uh, similarly, if you have um, you don't have a robust credit market or, or a non-predatory credit market in communities. Those communities are more likely to be bound to uh, more predatory-ish loans. We saw this in the lead up to the financial crisis. Um, the bar for assent in contract law is very low. We don't care if you read it. We don't care if you uh, if you understood it. We don't care if you would have agreed to it had you read it. We don't care if the terms seem onerous or one-sided mostly. Courts don't get into contract law and start rewriting contracts. We have courts looking at it. Just the question of did the con did the parties choose this? Again, choice uh, is indicated by this objective manifestation, not by a subjective choice. And that is going to have a different impact on people based on who they are and what sort of options they have. Um, let's look at another example, economic duress doctrine. This is a fairly limited doctrine. You don't have substantive review over whether something is, you know, onerous. You focus on the process itself. Did somebody freely choose? And in most cases, just because someone's sort of financially in, um, in a more dire strait than somebody else, that doesn't mean that when they agree to something, they're under economic duress. It's not imposed by the counterparty. There's not economic duress. Uh, we have this doctrine of unconscionability, and that doctrine creates some disparate impacts too, both because sometimes it's used in in a way that perhaps is patronizing and could take away choices, but more often it's it's not used because there's a great reluctance to disturb the choices of the parties in contract law. In the financial system, um, not only do we have this contract law basis to enforce debt obligations without any sort of systematic review of the fairness of terms, now that's changing a little bit with the CFPB, but that's still the baseline. We also have the, the long, long history of our consumer protection oversight, basically just being on more disclosure. And so you give someone 100 pages of disclosure, has that really empowered them or is it just really a way for the um, contracting other contracting party to protect themselves, uh, sort of risk management through disclosure? You have the intergenerational character of wealth and property, which is created through our property system that we allow people to gather wealth and protect it as they pass it on to future generations, which means that the allocations that have already been set in generations past persist through generations current and generations future. You have the rights of secured creditors to get all the value of pledged collateral and um, the lack of ability to get credit in a lot of places without collateral pledges. You have greater access to funds and lower cost lending to people with certain types of assets, especially homes um, and more assets. You have to pay more for your borrowed money if you're not a homeowner, for example. Um, you have punitive financial terms existing in all areas of the law, criminal law, civil law, fines and penalties and costs associated with policing and incarceration. I'm sure you've heard things about sort of how much they charge inmates for phone calls. You have uh, again, more costs accruing to uh, to certain people than to other people. And unfortunately, if you map that out by race, you see that the costs accruing to non-white groups are on average higher. So these are all baked into our financial and our legal system. Again, we have bias baked into the bankruptcy code. We protect our retirement funds. We protect those homesteads. We uh, make it hard to leave your student debt behind. We have a lot of loopholes that let people who are above median income still fall for, for Chapter 7 if they have car loans and home loans, which they usually do, and they can have big homes with a big, uh, a big mortgage, and that's going to let them file into Chapter 7 where someone who's renting that has a much lower income might not be able to because they can't afford to. Um, you have the cost to file and to successfully complete bankruptcy, which is a, co a transaction cost that's fairly uh, fairly equal, although it might even be more for poorer people. But of course, as a percentage of income, it's a lot higher for someone with a lower income. 
you have state exemption laws that are uh, included in some bankruptcy law, but also exists outside of bankruptcy law for collections that certain types of assets you can protect from your creditors and other types you can't. And we've made value judgments here in our society over time when forming these laws. And those value judgments are going to have a different impact on people with different kinds of assets. And um, you know, if we say we're gonna protect homes that you own, but not residents that you rent, or we're gonna protect your savings accounts or retirement accounts, or we're gonna protect certain uh, cars, but not motorcycles or whatever, that we have made a decision that we're gonna protect a home that's a single family home, but not a mobile home, for example. Um, again, uh, we have a difference between protecting ownership versus protecting rights to lease or have collateral that somebody you've pledged to get a loan. So uh, this all feeds in again to this intergenerational nature of assets and wealth. If I have an asset that's protected, no matter what kind of debt problems I get into, I can pass them on to future generations. And again, compound disparate impacts in a financial uh, sense. Now. Judicial system, the way it works in the aggregate, we have a lot of individual implicit biases. And that is coming from who the in-group is. 90% of attorneys out there are white still. And um, their in-group very well, in many cases, may have a racial component to them. And these implicit biases are going to impact at every decision point in every case, um, employment, cases, litigators, uh, prosecutorial discretion, which cases do you bring to to uh, charge someone with and bring them to court for, juvenile justice, uh, shooter bias, judge's opinion, sentencing, jury selection, and evidence, all of this already has baked into it implicit bias. Um, and what do I mean by implicit bias? Well, talked a little bit about this, but again, you have things, this comes out in the legal system a lot, false correlation. You see two things existing simultaneously and presume that there's a causation here when actually it's just sort of a, you know, cor illusory correlation. They happen to both exist, um, that they aren't caused or linked in any way. Um, confirmation bias, that if you already have an, you know, if you believe that somebody is a, is a good kid or whatever, then you're going to look for evidence of that and you're going to overweigh evidence um, that shows your, uh, foregone, uh, hoped for conclusion and, and discount things that worked the opposite. Similar to me bias, this is that in-group bias that we talked about before. Uh, like think about a judge trying to decide if somebody is being credible, for example, that's going to be easier for a judge to do because they're not reading the color written in a different language, you know, a different color, uh, it's just red written in blue, for example, if it's somebody who's not like them, they've already sort of bought into the idea that they could imagine themselves being that person. Um, so where do we see this in specific cases in the bankruptcy system? You have subjective determinations being made by bankruptcy attorneys. There was that chapter choice issue, which I talked about a lot, and it is important, but I don't want to make it sound like that's the only issue. That's just one of a whole host of issues where implicit bias has an impact in bankruptcy. You have this question of access to bankruptcy and ability to pay a fee. Um, attorneys are going to uh, after 9, 2005, they've been asked to actually affirm the valuation of the assets of a debtor. Are they more likely to accept a debtor's valuation proffers if the debtor is an in-group uh, member? I don't know, but possibly. Possibly prediction of success in a particular bankruptcy. Well, is this, going, is this person going to be able to make these payments? Is this person, is, or do they have to give up the car or something like that? Um, do I trust my client? Do I think that they're telling me the truth? <laughs> the whole truth. And that might work the other way, right? Do I trust my attorney? Do I want to tell my attorney the truth? Um, bankruptcy planning, which is a really interesting area of bankruptcy law, because there is a fine line between bankruptcy planning, which is smart, and bankruptcy fraud. And if you're not familiar with bankruptcy, I'm sure you can imagine the same pro issue that exists in tax, right? Tax planning versus tax fraud. You don't want to cross that line, but the line is sometimes hard to delineate. Um, and maybe what looks like planning or what you offer as planning in one context might not be uh, prudent planning, but rather something that's more abusive um, exploitation of loopholes in the code. Then there's a question of which assets you can retain. An attorney has to say, I believe this person can reaffirm this debt and keep it in order to keep your asset in, in chapter seven. Are they more likely to think that certain 
debtors can keep certain assets? I don't know, but that's a potential subjective determination by an attorney, and that's a place where implicit bias might have an effect. There's the question of uh, business advice. Do I tell you to liquidate your business and just go out of business, or can we restructure the debt? You're giving business advice or giving the legal impact of business decisions type of advice to your client. That's going to be colored by your subjectivity as well. And also budget decisions uh, for debtors who are below median income, if they're in a chapter 13, they have to establish a budget and it's not um, prescribed by the code. Does your budget include, can you uh, agree to include certain things in the budget or is that seen as things that you should have to give up? Um, like, do you have to, can you pay for orthodontia? Is that okay? Can you pay for uh, remedial reading? Is that okay for your kids? Um, uh, judges and d attorneys help their, debtors um, navigate these decisions. Now you're my, maybe making a different decision with respect to different types of budget decisions. You know, for me, oh gosh, I really think piano lessons are important. Maybe someone else doesn't, or I think orthodontia is important. important. Um, which one's more important? I don't know, but that is a subjective decision. How about the trustees and the judges? Well, we know justice isn't exactly blind. You have bankruptcy trustees who are uh, in charge of most consumer cases and bankruptcy judges who hear consumer uh, cases that actually become controversies. Um, there is a concern about this pre-bankruptcy planning and, and uh, use of the bankruptcy code as fraud. Are judges and trustees more likely to find fraud for certain debtors? I, I'm not saying that they are. I haven't done a study to see if we, you know, like we did with the chapter choice, like that was done. Um, I don't know, but this is a, a point where you could possibly have implicit bias creeping in. Um, questions of are certain uh, collateral assets part of the estate are those creditors adequately protected or should we let the car lender come and take the car loan even though there's bankruptcy? That turns on valuation issues and on other issues that have to do with will a debtor maintain that property well? Uh, that could be a pretty loaded determination as well. Questions of discharge of student debt. Student debts are not dischargeable in bankruptcy unless a judge finds that there is undue hardship. What is undue hardship? I mean, we have some tests at the law, but that's it's really a weighing of factors and a subjective determination. And I would think it would be very interesting to see our judges and trustees, are they more likely and attorneys, are they more likely to tell certain types of debtors you can get a discharge or you can't in your student debt? Um, budgets, especially if you're uh, below median income and you're setting a budget, that's going to be a subjective determination which things to include. Reaffirmations of the debt, as I mentioned, can the debtor cure the arrearages? Uh, chapter 13 and Chapter 11 plan feasibility. Are they going to be able to make these payments? Can you get the plan confirmed? Uh, judges will have to, questions or should they continue a case or should they dismiss if someone doesn't show up? Um, and credibility issue uh, of the debtors and questions, are they acting in good faith? All of that can be colored by people's bias. So how do we combat this in bankruptcy, but also anywhere? Um, I think the good news here is that implicit biases are malleable. So although we all have them, they can be changed. And there is some reason to do that. There's a good motivation. I think I like to believe that most of us, um, especially us in the legal profession, that we desire to be fair and we desire to be unprejudiced. Uh, even if we don't desire to be unprejudiced, we might desire to appear to be unprejudiced. So hopefully those are good motivations to take some effort to try to change implicit biases. Um, and there are some ways to invest in this effort, practicing specific strategies to avoiding stereotypic or prejudicial responses and changing the social context um, that you're inhabiting. So actually changing your, so your implicit bias. So one of them is recognizing and pushing back and the other one is actually changing what they are. So here are some steps that we could all take um, and that I hope people in the legal communities can take and that our system and aggregate can take. Um, the first one is to identify what the biases are, what their implications may be. Um, another one is to interrupt the bias. So first you have to, as we've been doing so far, sort of step back and consider where are biases creeping into the system, um, whether the system is me and my own practice or my own decision making, or whether the system is the bankruptcy system or the legal system or the, the world, right? And then we consider where those implications are. So that's sort of an awareness speak piece. But that's only the first step, of course. Then we have to think about how can I interrupt the bias where it might happen, or at least check it. Um, am I going to maybe 
have to engage in some higher level processing to make decisions in certain key areas. Uh, maybe that involves reducing the cognitive load, which is pretty challenging since we're all getting a lot of cognitive load all the time. Some of it has to do with which things should I be able to think fast about and which things do I need to slow my thinking about so that I am being a little bit more deliberative and engaged and aware. Um, the, uh, there's some processes that can help this, like checklists and organizational changes. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detailed now. Um, identifying the dot bias, we've talked about how the system treats people differently. And I think this is something that you could take to any area of the law, not just bankruptcy. This was just a case study, really, and, or, you know, uh, an example. But take a step back and say, are people being treated the same? And not just an individual case, right? Like this one person was treated better than this other person. But in aggregates, you can start to see patterns. Um, and what kind of implicit biases do I have? So there's sort of a self exploration, as I mentioned, and also where can these biases show up for myself and for other people? You know, where are those subjective points, those inflection points where things could go one way or another way based on a subjective determination that could be colored by these implicit biases? Interrupting the bias. Um, it's all very helpful to think of to, to create in your practice ways to check yourself. This is really hard to do. Um, Sometimes you give like a memo to yourself, these certain places pause and reflect. Um, sometimes you can check someone else if you have a partner or a friend or someone that you can run things by. Are there schemas that you need to tweak? When you think of male white scientists, maybe I need to change that schema in my mind, um, for example. Uh, that's fast thinking versus slow thinking. There's actually, I think, a book called Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking that you can check out. Um, which areas do I need to slow my thinking? This is hard. You know, we're in a world where things move very quickly and we value how quickly we can make decisions. And, you know, based on our experience, we know in our gut that we should go one way. You have to actually push back against that sometimes and say, here's a place where I need to think more deliberately about what has to be done. Um, can procedures help? Could I come up with a checklist? I had a student in my bankruptcy class once that said, you know what I think we should do is come up with this very comprehensive like flow chart where you put in inputs and it tells you at the end whether the client should go into a chapter seven or a chapter 13. So like I did at the very beginning when we said, okay, here's a bunch of reasons why you would be in one chapter versus another. And then if you had an input into the system, then maybe you could be more confident that the result is objective. Now we've had a lot of legal attempts at trying to create these sort of objective, almost like computer program inputs where you put in a bunch of information and they tell you where to go and they don't always work as well as you think they would. But you know, it's worth considering um, maybe having a checklist and having it guide you through rather than kind of gut judgments. This trust your gut is actually often sort of the worst way to use implicit bias because your gut is fueled by the implicit bias in a lot of cases. And then the best thing uh, is to just be constantly finding ways to practice, to push back against that, to read that word red written in blue, right? To, to kind of uh, accept the fact that maybe your instinct on certain things is colored not just by what you hope it is, but by things that maybe are rooted deep in your psyche. Um, so some ways to, to combat these implicit diets is give yourself more time for decision-making in places where subjectivity matters. And maybe write out why you're making a decision. Don't just, uh, as the one book says, blink and, and make a decision based on your uh, impulse. Um, these objective frameworks, things like checklists, are very, very helpful tools to help us stay grounded and less biased in our legal practice. Um, confirmation bias is something that we should constantly be aware could be coloring uh, our impressions of our clients, of uh, people on the other side. Uh, judges are thinking this about us. You know, stop and ask if you're jumping to a conclusion and make sure you've gathered balanced evidence. Uh, explore and consider the opposite conclusion. You know, maybe this person isn't telling me a lie, or maybe this person isn't telling me the truth, uh, just to test your confirmation bias and see where it shows up. Um, the similar to me, this in-group bias, be aware of that. The fact that our groupings, although they make us feel comfortable and give us ways to navigate the world, that they're very arbitrary, frankly. And um, that just because I feel more comfortable with person X and persons Y, that doesn't mean that person X is more valuable or that I wouldn't have a closer friendship with person Y if I get to know them. 
Um, one thing that we can do in order to combat this is actually to expand, deliberately expand your social circle. If you only ever associate with people who go to your church, maybe find someone who's outside your church. If you've only ever had made friends with people who grew up in this country, maybe find someone from a different country, from a different race or ethnic group, and include a more diverse um, selection of people in your social circle, that's going to help create a, a diffuse boundary in the definition of who your um, of who your in group is. Uh, look for alternate bases of commonality. If I've always chosen my friends based on level of education, maybe I could do it based on something else, uh, based on common language or based on geographic proximity or something else. Um, I could look for counter stereotypes and 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 note those to myself. You have a lot of good books that are being written trying to do this for children, trying to uh, bring up counter stereotypes. Like I love those books that are like Ada Quist scientists they have for little kids right now. But these things were helpful because they help balance out these biases when people are forming them at those very early ages. And um, any efforts that lawyers can do, I really think this is important to have empathy, to start to understand where our clients or even the other side are coming from, um, what has led them to make decisions that they've made. That's going to be so helpful. This is a soft skill that isn't taught or tested in law school, but it's having an empathetic lawyer. I don't even know how you could value that. That's going to be so important for our clients in the future. Um, also, we can adopt certain procedural changes to combat this. Uh, this can be done systemically with respect to organizational changes, um, changing the approach to making decisions and having things determined, changing assumptions um, that exist at the law and accountability. It's hard to have accountability if you're in solo practice, so maybe get a partner or a friend and just sort of check yourself. But these are all really important ways to ensure that we have a more equitable and unbiased system. So I am wrapping up. I think I'm running out of time. I'm watching the time here, and I, I don't know. I think I can take questions. I'd love to. We have, I think, 10 minutes. Is that right, Shannon? Um, and so I'll let her moderate. But uh, if you do have any questions or you have any comments or you would love to talk to me more, I'm happy to talk about this. This is my email address. I'm at Washburn University. I'm andrea.boyak at washburn.edu. And if you are so fascinated by this that you want to know even more, here's some other places to look. The ABA's put out a 20-minute film about implicit bias in the legal profession to begin with. Uh, the Kerwin Institute has a really interesting um, research and article about understanding implicit bias. And then there's a memo to attorneys that Professor Dickerson uh, in a 2009, I believe, article wrote to attorneys um, who are practicing in bankruptcy specifically about specific steps that could be done to combat implicit bias in bankruptcy practice. And Shannon, I'll turn it over to you um, and I'll, I guess I can stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint and we'll see if there's any questions in the last few minutes. I don't know if I can't. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. So we don't currently have any questions. Um, uh, there are some thank yous for your presentation. Um, we do have seven minutes left. If anyone does have questions, they want to submit to the, the chat. Um, but at this point, we don't have questions yet. Okay. Well, I mean, I could also talk more or we could add things. I was trying to give ourselves, I think I was told to give at least five minutes and I barely have that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you have perfect timing. Great. Well, I'll give a second just in case anyone does have a question. I will say I think that if, if you are engaged in any sort of bankruptcy practice, these are really important issues. And sometimes when we're talking about uh, bias in the profession or discrimination or racial injustice, we think in terms of criminal justice or constitutional rights. And we don't think in terms of economic and financial rights. I don't think you can separate the two, though, because I think that people who are less powerful economically are often the ones that are uh, suffering in terms of state power. So the power and the money, as we've seen in so many cases, often go together, right? You follow the money to see where the power lies. And that also means that steps to, to create more fairness in, um, in power and politics and crime and constitutional rights has to also include an economic component. So, final food for thought. Okay. Um, well, we don't have any questions at this point, but uh, thank you for presenting. And if anybody has any questions, now would be the time to submit those questions. Again, also, I, I'm happy to oh, wonder if I talk a little bit about more undue hardship requirements, student loans. Okay, I would love to. The undue hardship requirement 
um, requires that uh, in most states, there's a couple different approaches, but in most states, the judge can give a discharge for student loans, but only if the debtor can prove certain things. And this is in bankruptcy. And one of the things has to be that they've made a, um, a reasonable good faith effort to have paid the loans back. And that just by saying those words, hopefully it's pretty obvious that that is a fairly subjective determination, <clears throat> right? I mean, you can have, you can have, uh, I'm wondering how I can do this. I don't know how to make it more panels. So I'm trying to get it so I can see something other than just me. Aha, here we go. Um, feel free to turn on your camera or I can just look at boxes with letters in them. Um, <clears throat> but you have a determination that the efforts have been made to repay, which some courts have tried to um, define as a certain number of payments. Uh, other times it's just purely going to be a determination of whether they've tried. And so that's going to turn based on sort of how much their income is and how much they have spent on student loans versus something else. Have they bought other things? And sometimes courts will say, oh, well, they bought a car, but they didn't pay their student loan payments. Therefore, they could have paid more to the student loans. Um, there's also a determination in made by the court about whether or not there is the reasonable likelihood or at least the possibility of the person who owes the student loan debt in earning enough money to pay it off in the future. So it's not so much to say that these student loan discharge decisions are being made in a way that is discriminatory and that people get discharges more if they're white or black. I don't know. But I just, when I'm thinking about places where, uh, where subjectivity creeps in, it's one of those places. And if you couple that with the fact that more debt is held, that, that you're more likely to have student loan debt and it's more likely to be larger and it's more likely to be in default and have to do with an incomplete degree um, if you are a person of color. Those are some, some complicated and troubling combinations, right? Because although we sometimes talk about the amount of student loan debt, the really concerning thing about student loan debt is not how much it is, but are you going to be able to pay it off? Because if you graduate from law school and you have big student loan debts and you get a great job, you can pay it off. In fact, law school graduates have a very low default rate on student loan debt. Where you have a high default rate is people who do like a one year certification degree somewhere, but they don't finish or the school is not accredited and then they can't get a job. And so they've spent all that money, but it hasn't increased their income at all. Um, and, or you've never finished college, but you went for three years. Uh, and if you didn't have family money going into college, so you borrowed the whole amount, those types of student loan debt situations are much more likely to lead to sort of chronic default and inability to pay. Um, you also could argue that just our entire system that creates such a barrier to getting a discharge is racist, because if you're more likely to need a discharge, if you're non-white, denying it to everybody is going to have a disparate impact. There's another question in the chat. Um, they're asking um, if there's a way to, yes. I, I do not know if there's a way to post slides. I, I'd be happy to share them, but I'm not sure where, how to do that. So maybe someone who's organizing this conference can tell me and I'm happy to do it. Although if there's something you're interested in um, and you haven't found a posted slide because we haven't figured that out, send me an email. I'm happy to send it to you. And this, this has been recorded, so I'm not sure where the recording will go either, but <laughs> um, I believe the, the recordings of these sessions will be posted somewhere as well. Great. Well, I think we're out of time, right? Is that true? One, one minute left. One minute, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you're my, down my the wire. Like, the, the professor never, Professor Boyd never runs out of things to say before class is up, it's true. Um, Anyway, I, it, is, it is a really interesting uh, question and there's so much to be said. And one of the great things about being in the law is that we can actually make a difference by recognizing and, and addressing some of these issues, the things that create systemic unfairness. I mean, I think it's sort of a calling for all lawyers to say, it's not enough for me to just come in and kind of go through the motions of the law <clears throat> that I wanna actually do justice and doing justice involves doing justice for everyone um, not just for people who are in my in-group or not just for people who the law happens to treat more favorably.